it's really great to see everybody today. Yeah. Looks like you uh, survived Thanksgiving, right? Tryptophan has worn off, I hope, so I can keep you awake and alert today. Um, cool stuff that's uh, going on. Uh, you might have noticed if you came in the lobby today, big shout out to all of you who are online, and you wouldn't have noticed it in the lobby, but for those of you that are here in person today, we have a new display that'll just help us over the next 12 months keep track of uh, what God is doing through our Bethel Kingdom Initiative and uh, all of the uh, generosity and the giving that uh, we are a part of. Thank you for your faithfulness. You'll notice in the bulletin today, and for those that are online, uh, there's, uh, there's notes as well, but in the bulletin, uh, you'll see that we're up over $537,000 for our sacrifice offering, which is really amazing. Yeah, we thank the Lord for that. And thank you to so many of you who have participated. Our goal is really to have everybody just participate in some way. I think that's, uh, that's super important. Uh, some of you have not yet uh, given and just still praying through that, which I totally understand. Uh, others maybe have not done a, uh, not done a uh, pledge card yet. Some won't, and that's okay too. But we're just great to see everybody uh, involved. And I just want to give a shout out. Two weeks ago, I, I pitched... Uh, what I call the 90-day tithe challenge. And 33 of you took me up on that challenge. And I'm very proud of you for doing that. And the 90-day tithe challenge is this, that, is this, that. If you don't normally tithe, then do it for the next 90 days and see if God actually set, does what he said he would do out of Malachi 3.10. And so 33 of you, I prayed for you on Thanksgiving morning, and I prayed for you this morning. And I will continue to pray for you uh, as you test God, because God said we could test him in this way. So a big shout out to, uh, to all of you. Um, also, let me mention in that display out there, you'll see all the white portion, uh, and then you'll see markers that are there. Uh, we want you to record your prayers on those white portions. So if you have a prayer that you're praying for between now and our 75th anniversary here at Bethel Church, uh, you can write that prayer on the white portion on the big blocks, and yes, those are giant Legos is what you saw, okay? And you can, white, you can write your prayer uh, on that white portion, and people can, uh, much like a prayer wall, can come and put their hands on that wall and pray for those needs. So I hope that you'll do that as well. So I read a story some time ago uh, about a guy that frequented a particular restaurant, and he went there a lot, and he always ordered the same thing hot and sour soup but the craziest thing would happen because he would order the hot and sour soup and then he would criticize the cook I mean nobody really knew why I mean the guy was rude and kind of obnoxious and you know he kind of sat up at the at the at the kind of the bar area and then there's the cook right there so the cook could hear everything that he was saying well this happened uh, literally uh, for months, and every time he was rude to the cook, the cook would always respond the same way. Ah, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And that would be it. Well, months now, this has went on. Finally, the guy came in one day, ordered the same soup, soup that he always ordered. Only this time, instead of being rude and sarcastic towards the cook, he raised a question, and he looked at the cook, and he says, you know what, I've been coming into this restaurant for months and months, and I always order the same thing, and then I'm always rude to you, and you always respond to me the same way. Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you. And he says, I just want to know why you're so grateful when I'm so rude. And the cook responded, with a big smile, because every time you're rude, I spit in your soup. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I want to talk about a grateful story today. That's not it, by the way. <laughs> That's not the one we're going to look at today. Uh, and I want to start by asking two questions. And if you have a bulletin today, for those of you that are online, if you're on Bethel.org, there's notes. You can click on notes there. Uh, for those that are on uh, Facebook and uh, also uh, the other one that I just forgot. Uh, uh, anyways, if you're online, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, they'll be in the link there. Uh, uh, there'll be a link, rather, in the chat there, so you can go to the outline. Hope you take the outline out. At the top, there are two questions that I'm raising. 
uh, today that I think are very important. What are you grateful for? And what do you do when you don't feel grateful? Or when you feel ungrateful? What are you grateful for? And what do you do when you feel ungrateful? Last Sunday, if you missed it, Pastor George did a great job of really taking a deep dive in the First Thessalonians 5 and verse 18. Did a great job. Go online and watch that message if you haven't seen it. But I want us to look at that verse again, not because we're going to do another deep dive in it. He already did that. But I want you to see something about the will of God for your life today out of 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 18. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The reality today is, is that God wants to write a grateful story with your life and with my life. He does. This Thanksgiving weekend, we're going we're gonna to un- unpack that idea a little bit. But I want you to think about it. God wants, God wants to write a grateful story with your life, no matter what. Like, no matter what. Where you've come from, what you're going through right now, whatever the odds are stacked against you, he wants to write a grateful story with your life. And for some today, when they hear those words, they actually get angry. Because they say, you don't know my story, Frank. You don't know my story. You don't know what I've been through, what I've seen in my life, what I've experienced, and I would have to say, you're right. But one of the things that I love about God, there's a lot of things I love about God, but one of the things that I love about the God of creation and that is that he doesn't play favorites. In fact, he'll always speak against that in his word, the idea of favoritism. In other words, everybody's got a fair shot at a grateful life. Everybody's got a fair shot at God's best for their life because he doesn't play favorites favorites. And that's true because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Now, we're going to come to the Lord's table a little bit later today as I wrap up the teaching. Those of you that are online, you'll want to have a wafer or a piece of bread ready to go with some juice. But we're going to come to the Lord's table today. We're going to remember again what he has done for us. But it's because of that, it's because of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection that every one of us have a shot at a grateful story in our life, no matter what. And you're going to see what I mean. Because in Luke chapter 17, and if you have your Bibles, you have it on smart device today, um, or you've got a physical Bible, I encourage you to, to turn to the New Testament, to the Gospel of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. In verse 17 today, because what's written in 17, chapter 17, is the most unlikely story, unlikely grateful story. I mean, it's like one of the most unlikely grateful stories in all of Scripture other than Job. I want us to look at the story today out of Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Then I'll give you some takeaways on how God works in our life to write a grateful story no matter what, no matter what. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, that is Jesus, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. Samaria was a different country. It was a different ethnic group. Twelve, as he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity or compassion or mercy on us. So all ten of them in a loud voice. When he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. In other words, they were healed of leprosy. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. Verse 16, and he threw himself at Jesus' feet, and he thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Go on. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? It's a very important point. Then he said to him, Jesus said to the Samaritan leper who was healed, Rise and go, for your faith has made you well. If you were to ask people in the first century, Romans, 
Jewish people, Samaritan people, Greek people, which would have been the four main groups, ethnic groups in that day. If you would ask, and they wouldn't agree on much, but if you were to ask them, all would agree that the life of a leper is going to be about the least people, it's going to be about, it's going to be the, the, the people who will have the longest shot as a, at experiencing a grateful story. If you were to ask them, they would say, no way, no way would lepers experience a grateful story. Let me illustrate it for you for just a moment. I want you to imagine if you're a kid like so many kids, and I'll explain that uh, slide in a minute. Uh, uh, so many kids, you played with your friends in first century Palestine. That's the way it works. But as you came into adolescence and then, eight, and then late adolescence, you began to notice a tingling and a loss of feeling in some of your extremities. It would have been your fingers and your ears. It would have been your nose and your toes. And you would have begun to uh, experience this. And as time went on, there would have been lesions and wounds that would have shown up on your arms and your legs, but you would not have known it right away because you couldn't feel them. And then from there, life became a downward spiral. You would have intense eye pain, and eventually you would lose feeling altogether. And you would carry around the smell of death in your life. Now, these two pictures here are not actual lepers. I chose not to do that today, but they're actually actors. That's why they're smiling. But they're actors who actually were hired to bring awareness to World Leprosy Day. But if you want to know what a leper would look like, they did a really good job of making them look like one. This was the life of a leper. Essentially, it's a, it's a bacteria that attacks the nerves. It was a miserable life. And if you lived in the time of Jesus, you were banished. You were banished from your family and from your friends. And you were required to yell every time you were in proximity of people, unclean, unclean. In other words, you're unacceptable. I'm unacceptable. Don't come around me. Interesting. In fact, in the Old Testament law in Leviticus, this is what it says, Leviticus 13, verse 46, as long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. One of the practical reasons is it was so contagious. What are you grateful for today, and what do you do when you feel ungrateful? There are two great themes in this story in Luke chapter 17 that we're going to look at. First is that God wants to write a grateful story with your life and with my life, no matter what. No matter what. But the second big idea out of this story, and Jesus models both of these, is that God actually wants to use us to help others discover their grateful story. Because there is a grateful story to be discovered. People just need to know the way. They need to know the way. People today don't need somebody to spit in their soup, but they do need somebody to point them in the direction of healing and hope that comes through Jesus Christ. And God's asked us to do that today. Let me leave you with three takeaways before we come to the Lord's table today in your outline. And uh, this has to do with how God writes a grateful story in our lives. Number one, trust Jesus for what you need. Don't be uh, fooled by the simplicity of of these action steps. This is what we see in our story. Trust Jesus for what you need. Trust Jesus for what you need. Everyone wants a miracle. No one wants to need one. I get it. Because if I need a miracle in my life, that means I'm facing something that's bigger than me, that it's beyond my ability to fix or my ability to handle. It's a really big problem. In the first century world, leprosy was a really big problem. These lepers not only experienced rejection, they experienced physical decline, deterioration that eventually would take their lives. It was a long, slow, and often lonely death. There are times in our lives when we just face stuff that's really big. Of course, that's been true for most of the world over the last 20 plus months. We just face some really big things. The holidays are that way for many. I'll be candid. 
It's my, one of my favorite times of the year, but I know that's not true for some. They have legitimate heartache as they come into the holidays. This is why, once again, just as a heads up, we're going to be doing the surviving the holidays uh, 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 class as well. It's going to be uh, both uh, through grief share and through our divorce care groups. And you can sign up for that. Anybody can sign up for that. And I can't encourage you enough, especially when you're dealing with emotions that are really difficult right now as you come into the holidays. You don't want to do that alone. Okay? So make sure you're a part of surviving the holidays. By the way, there's an insert that's in your bulletin today. Um, and for those of you, I don't know if it's online or not. Well, it is online if you go to our, our main page. But it lists you everything that's going on this Christmas. Okay? So I hope you'll take advantage of it. Put it on your refrigerator, slip it in your Bible, but make sure you hold, you hold on to it, okay? Uh, but, but surviving the holidays is super, super valuable um, um, gathering that helps people when they're facing difficulties during this holiday season. The truth is there's just some stuff that's just really big. It's really big, and it's tough on us. And in that moment, we're going to choose who we're going to trust with that really big thing. Everybody does this. Don't miss it. Everybody does. It doesn't matter who you are, where you live in the world. It doesn't matter whether you are religious or you're not religious. It doesn't matter if you're an atheist or you're an agnostic. It just doesn't matter. Everybody does this. Everybody puts their faith somewhere. We may not use that kind of language, but that's what we're doing. Everybody does. Everybody puts their faith somewhere. So this one leper in our story in Luke chapter 17 is singled out, but he's a Samaritan. Remember, I said that was important to remember. He's a Samaritan. What did that mean for him in the first century world? It means that double, double uh, rejection. Not only is he rejected because he's a leper, he's rejected because he's a Samaritan, at least by the Jewish community, because Jewish people and Samaritans hated each other. That's why Jesus said what he said. In Luke chapter 17, in verse 18. His words are very telling. Look what he says. He says, has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? He was a leper twice rejected, and he was the only one that came back He should have been the one who trusted Jesus the least because Jesus was a Jewish teacher. Yet he was the one who trusted Jesus the most. Faith led all ten lepers to their healing. Don't miss that. On their way, they believed to show themselves to the priest, and all ten were healed. Jesus, Master, have pity on us. They were all healed. But only one of those former lepers trusted Jesus beyond the miracle. How about you? Do we trust him beyond the miracle? Because Jesus, in that person's life, he not only healed his body, he healed his soul. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. I love what what Oswald Chambers said about faith. Let's uh, put it up on the screens today. Faith is not some weak, pitiful emotion, but it's a strong, vigorous confidence built on the fact that God is holy love. And even though you cannot see him right now and cannot understand what he is doing, You know him. Faith is the supreme effort of your life. Throwing yourself with abandon and total confidence upon God. It's a great word. This is in your outline today, and I hope you'll take it and post it on social media. For those of you that are online, post it in the the chat today as well. Every time I express gratitude to God, I deepen my trust in him. Don't miss that. Every time I express gratitude to God, I deepen my trust in Him. What are you grateful for? What do you do when you feel ungrateful? Well, for sure, make sure that you trust Jesus with what you need. Keep trusting Him. Don't give up. Don't give up. This leper knew that God had shown him compassion through the healing words that Jesus spoke. And he came back and he thanked them. And that leads us to number two. Second takeaway and how God writes a grateful story in our lives. Number two, thank Jesus for what you have. Thank him for what you have. Trust him for what you need. And then thank him for what you have. This is another way in which God writes a grateful story in our lives. Again, don't let the simplicity fool you. 
Sometimes these are the last things that we do. Trust God or Jesus for what we need, and then also thank him for what we have. Again, in your outline, you can post this. We tend to believe what we repeat, which is why our words matter. We tend to believe what we repeat, which is why our words matter. What are you thankful for today? Speak it. Speak it. Speak it to God. Speak it to others. Say it right now. For those of you that are online today, go in the chat and and use a word or a phrase of what you are thankful for right now. Those in the house today, write it on your outline. Write it on your bulletin today. Punch it in your phone today. What you are thankful for. Because every time you and I speak what we are thankful for, not only does our faith grow, so does our gratitude. Because we tend to believe what we repeat. In the movie Princess Bride, Buttercup's servant boy, Wesley, he becomes the dreaded pirate Roberts. And he has a phrase that he used all the time whenever Buttercup would ask him to do anything. Whatever she asked him to do, he would always say the same thing. I want you to look at this short video clip. From the princess and then he spoke of a girl of surpassing beauty and faithfulness. I can only assume he meant you. You should bless me for destroying him before he found out what you really are. And what am I? Faithfulness he talked of, madam, your enduring faithfulness. Now tell me truly, when you found out he was gone, did you get engaged to your prince that same hour, or did you wait a whole week out of respect for the dead? You mocked me once, never do it again! I died that day! You can die, too, for all I care. As you wish. Oh, my sweet Wesley. What have I done? Ow! Oh! (laughs) As you wish. As you wish. Following Jesus and living... A grateful story is a lot like that. It's always saying, as you wish. Not as I wish. You'll never get there with as I wish. But we will get there with as you wish. In this story, you have all ten of these lepers. And they are told to go show themselves to the priest. The reason why that was true is in the Old Testament law, the priest was the one who was responsible for taking a look at you and saying, you're, cl- you're clean. No longer do you have this dreaded disease. So all followed in the moment, which is a good thing. But only one followed through to a thankful heart. Only one. And this is why Jesus raises the question in Luke chapter 17, in verse 17. He raises an important question. He, Jesus asks, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? The question wasn't for Jesus' benefit. He already knew the answer. The question was for the benefit of the one who came back and thanked Jesus for his healing. The question possibly was raised as well for all the group that was mingling around watching what was going on with ten lepers. This would have been a sight to be seen. And maybe some of them were wondering, maybe I also should follow Jesus. It seemed like it worked out really well for that leper. Maybe I should as well. It's easy to approach life, and it's easy to approach our, my, my relationship with Jesus, your relationship with Jesus, if you have one today. It's so easy for us to approach it with focusing on what we don't have. What we don't have, instead of what we do. Now, it's not that the Bible is against us asking, well, what does it mean? What's the impact of my life if I give my life over to Jesus Christ? What can I count on? And I've said it for many years. You can certainly know this. When you turn your life over to Jesus Christ, you know that you can live a forgiven life, a free life, and a forever life. That's a reality. It's a reality of the cross and the empty tomb. So the Bible doesn't shy away from the benefits of the payoffs of living a life of faith after Jesus. But there are just times in life when you and I feel like we've been shoved down the hill of life. 
And in that moment, will our response to Jesus still be as you wish? As you wish. Thank him. Will you thank him for what you have? There are other times, the flip side of the coin, when life is just good. It's clicking on all cylinders. It's a sweet time. I'm in a sweet spot in my life. That's great. Will you still thank him for what you have? Will you still say as you wish? It's interesting to me, in these nine lepers, they wanted the benefit of what Jesus could do without being obedient in gratitude to him. I'll remind us again that part of the will of God is to be thankful in all circumstances. In all circumstances. Never allow the hard times or the good times to keep you and me from saying as you wish. Thanking him for what you have. That leads to the third takeaway. Touch others as you go. Touch others as you go. Uh, when I look at the story, it just kind of jumps out at me that the, this leper, this one leper, it feels like Jesus is commissioning him to go and touch others. It doesn't say that, but it sure has that feel. And Jesus was masterful at this. This is what he is doing. Notice what Jesus says about the one who came back and was grateful that he doesn't say about the other nine who didn't. Did you catch it? In Luke chapter 17 and verse 19. Verse 19, look at it with me. Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. He's already healed the leprosy when Jesus speaks these words. Rise and go, for your faith has made you well. All were healed of leprosy, but one was made well or whole. What does it mean? Well, the phrase has to do with being saved. That's literally what the word means. He was saved. He was rescued. He was restored. He was brought into a new life, a different life, a changed life. The one who expressed his gratitude to Jesus was not only healed physically, he was healed fully. See, his biggest problem wasn't a physical problem. His biggest problem was, is there a way to find hope? Is hope available? Can things get better? Can things change? Jesus not only gave him a restored body, he gave him a restored soul. And there are people everywhere this holiday season that you and I are going to see, maybe we're some of them who maybe believe that their greatest need is physical. And there are some big physical needs right here in our own church family, no doubt about it. There are some really big physical needs, but it's not our biggest need. Our biggest need is to know that we can anchor ourselves in an unshakable hope, that our life can change, that life can be better, that life can be forever, that we can count on that, that we can count on a life that could be restored, A life that actually can experience real hope and real love and real joy and real peace. It's all wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. It was Jesus who stepped out of eternity and he entered humanity. It was that same Jesus who was not only the son of God, but was also the son of man. And the eternal became mortal. It's shocking that the eternal became mortal born in a manger, experienced everything this broken life has to offer, just like you and I experienced this broken life, so did he. But he did more than experience it. He overcame it. He conquered it. Starting next Sunday, we kick off a Christmas series all month long, and we're going to unpack the impact of Jesus' arrival on earth. It's called Advent. Advent means arrival. And we're going to do it in a creative way through the frictional life of George Bailey. Again, all of this is listed in your insert that's in your bulletin today. The title of our Christmas series is It's a Wonderful Life? Question mark. Can it be? Can it be? I did a leadership devotional a couple of weeks ago with all of our staff. And I made the statement in that devotional of how important it is for people of faith in Jesus to be attractional, to live an attractional life, for Bethel to be an attractional church, a people of promise, a people of hope. 
It's really attraction. Uh, to live a life in such a way that makes people ask why. You're, you live your life in such a way that people look at you and wonder, what is it about you? What is it about this place? Most people in Silicon Valley, and I told the staff this, most people in Silicon Valley don't, give up on, don't get up on a Sunday morning and ask, I wonder where I can find a really good church to go to. Some do, I'm sure, but most don't. But I promise you, there's a whole lot of people that woke up today, that are out and about today, and in the back of their mind, in those quiet moments, they wonder if they can actually live a life of hope, where it's not always changing. They actually wonder in those quiet moments if they can live a life of love, if they can actually discover a love that is not based on a political persuasion or on a cultural ideology. And the moment I don't line up with one or the other, then I go from being loved to being hated. That is a very fragile love. But people look for a love that is beyond that. Is there a joy and is there a peace in our lives that is unshakable, that cannot be taken from us? Bethel Church family, this Christmas season is an important opportunity for a lot of reasons. For us to make sure we pray and we invite. Will we create a safe space for people to come and discover? People to come and work through the woundedness and the hurts. People to come and, 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 and finally, and finally connect with the Savior of their soul. You and I all play a part in that. It's going to be a great Christmas season. Christmas Eve is going to be wonderful. We're bringing the snow back, just so you know. The snow is coming back, and it's going to be great. And we're going to have lots of fun stuff for kids in the afternoon, train rides and jump houses and all that. And then we're going to have a Christmas Eve service, 5 to 6 p.m. It'll be one hour service. It's going to be great, great music worship, meaningful message. It's a great opportunity to invite, to pray and invite, to pray and invite. Jesus wrote a grateful story with one of the most unlikely people on planet Earth, a leper. And he desires to write a grateful story with our lives as well. Be the one who trusts Jesus for what you need and don't stop keep trusting him. Be the one who thanks Jesus for what you have. Instead of us always focusing on what we don't have, let's make sure we're thankful for what we do have. And even when we've been kicked down the hill of life, let's make sure we still yell, as you wish. As you wish. And then be the one who goes from this place and touches others in Jesus' name. Luke 17, verse 19, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. We come to the Lord's table today, and I invite you to take the elements out as we do. We are reminded some of the last words of Jesus before he would return to heaven. This is after his resurrection. And if you've not been served communion, you don't have uh, the wafer in the cup, if you want to raise your hand, our ushers will make sure you get one uh, today. Just keep your hand up until you're served. Thank you. As we come to that, to the communion table, we're reminded again of some of Jesus' last words after his resurrection. And he said, go and make disciples of all nations. And I would remind us today as we come into this Christmas season that the cross and the empty tomb isn't just about you and it isn't just about me. It isn't just for you and it isn't just for me, but it's for those who don't know yet, those who don't understand the purpose of the crucifixion and the resurrection, those who don't understand the love, joy, peace that Jesus brings. The scriptures say, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. 
and he said, this is my body broken for you. Let's break our, our way for today. Those of you that are online, break it as well. Because of his brokenness, we could receive everything and more that I've just, discovered, just uh, mentioned to us today. Everything and more. What do you need today? I would invite you as just a simple act of faith to stand. And we're going to pray all across this auditorium. Those of you that are at home or wherever you might be and watching online today, wherever you might be in the world today, we invite you to stand as well. Because God wants to meet our needs today. He cares about our needs today. He wants to grow a grateful heart in our lives today. And Jesus, as we stand all across this sanctuary, those online today, those at Santa Clara today. And God, we just pause and realize that you laid down your life that we might pick up life eternal. It's a life that can live forgiven. I don't have to be ruled by guilt and shame. I can be free of that. It's a life that is more and more learning what it is to be free in Jesus. To not be controlled or pushed down by habits and hang-ups, thoughts and others, but to live a free life in Jesus. And it's a life that never ends. It's a forever life. It's not like it starts when we die. It's already started. The forever life has already started. And because of these things, Lord, we know that there is hope. And there is peace and there is joy and there is love that cannot be matched nor taken away. And it's wrapped up in you. And you demonstrated your love for us. That while we were still sinners, while we were still in rebellion against you, you died for us. It's hard to get our head around that, but we are certainly grateful. And it's by your woundedness that we are made whole, just like that leper. Not just heal in body, but heal in soul. And today I pray for healing, and I speak healing in the name of Jesus today because of the cross and the empty tomb. Come today and heal physical bodies, the supernatural power of your Holy Spirit. Come today and heal emotions. Come today and heal relationships. Come today and heal. Come today and bring your wisdom and your provision. Lord, we pause and remember Supriya today. She needs a touch from you as well, Pastor Michael's wife. And we pray for your supernatural touch in her body today, God. You protect her and her little one that's growing inside of her. Bless them today. God, meet needs today in this place. And come and have your way in us. For the one that gives their life away to you, that person never loses. What we give away, we never lose. And we're grateful for that today. Some that need to be freed from guilt and shame today, I speak freedom in the name of Jesus. Freedom in the name of Jesus. For the one who is discouraged, for the one that battles fear, God, I just pray for your peace to come. And we thank you today. You are more than enough today. You have called us to follow you in our generation today. You want to reach this generation with the gospel. We want to be a part of that. Before we eat this wafer, we join our hearts together and pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit this Christmas season. We pray for family and friends and neighbors and those that don't know you, God, or those who have been wounded and fallen away, that you will work by your Spirit in their lives. Use us. Use us. Use us today. We love you, Lord. We thank you, and we receive from you today. Bless this waver as we eat in Jesus' name. Let's eat together. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.
we receive from you today. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill us today. Come, Holy Spirit, and meet us today in this moment. Meet us today. Strengthen us today. Lead us today. Use us today for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. After the meal that night, prior to him going to the cross, he took the cup. He said, said, this cup is the new covenant. It's the new deal made by my shed blood. As often as you drink it, remember me. Remember me. The brutality of the cross reminds us of God's commitment to justice and love. Justice and love. Because we can't just have it our way and come to him. None of us measure up. But he loved us enough to send his son to make a way where there was no way. And in Peter, it tells us that God is patient in his return because he doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Oh, may that be our heart today. May that be our heart today, church. Because when we hold this cup, we're reminded again that Jesus spilled his blood for all. May we pray today that all would come to repentance, all turn and follow him, that none would perish. Jesus, as we hold this cup today, we're reminded again of your great love. And I pray in this moment that you would, that you would just flood our hearts with that reality. Some today just need to be reminded that you are near. You're not only great, you're not only big, you're close. And so I pray in this moment that we would be reminded of that. And I pray, God, that you would burden us for those that are around us. Maybe some of them have spit in our soup. It's not right. But you know what? They still need to know you. Help us to be that example. Help us to be that example. Help us to be that witness to the least, the last, the lost, that they might find faith, hope, and love in Jesus Christ. Let us be that witness as every generation and race thrives together. Let us be that witness today. Bless this cup as we drink it. And we pray it in your strong name. Amen. Amen. Let's drink together. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, we worship you. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. Church family, let's stand. Let's bless him. Can we worship him today? Can we bless his name today? Celebrate him today? Amen.
Thank you, Lord, for all you've done in our hearts today. I pray that we'd be, we would be grateful and thankful for what you've done, and that we wouldn't forget to double back and say thank you. And so, Lord, as we continue this morning, be with us in your precious name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. We are so glad that you were here. Um, if you would like prayer, you can come down to the front. We'll have some prayer partners for you, and we just pray blessings on your day as you go. Have a great day.